Hey there, Jeff Manchester, Manchester Music, welcome. Now, right before this channel went on a break, I finally received some loudspeakers I've been expecting for quite some time from a manufacturer called HEAD, which actually stands for Heinz Electrodynamic Designs. They're right behind me on the speaker stands. And if you're staring at these things going, haven't I seen these before? It's very likely that you're mistaking them for Atom Audio loudspeakers. And funny enough, physicist Heinz Klaus left Atom and founded Head in 2015 with his son. I've actually got plenty more to say about the aesthetics of these loudspeakers a little further along in the video, so stick around for that. While they're a relatively young company, they've been slowly gaining notoriety in the pro audio community for their studio monitors, their subwoofers, tower mains, and headphones. The pair I was sent to review are called the Head Type 20 Mark II three-way active studio monitors. They're a three-way speaker, meaning you've got a dedicated driver for the mid-range, Unlike my Focal Solo BEs, which have been in the studio for a long time, which are two-way, so just a tweeter and a woofer. Now they come in black and white, and of course you're looking at the black ones behind me. It's worth noting that there's a smaller size Type 5, a larger Type 7, the second largest, which is the Type 20s behind me, and then the largest, which is the Type 30s, which would be too much power for this room. I've had these loudspeakers in my room for the last month running with sound ID reference. So it's safe to say they're fully broken in and I've really gotten to know the sound signature of the loudspeakers. I even ran a few tests at equal SPLs running the Focals versus the Type 20s. Now, if you know anything about loudspeakers, it's quite foolish to compare a two-way to a three-way loudspeaker system, but what I was actually listening for was the difference between the Focal Beryllium tweeters versus the Airmotion Transformer tweeters in the heads to see if I could perceive any differences and then make judgments about the benefits of each tweeter, and more on that later. So we know they certainly look a lot like a pair of atoms in shape and form, but what actually differentiates them from Atom in substance? I mean, not just from Atom, but from everyone else in the market too. Well, first off, Head is very proud of their air motion transformers, which they say are handmade in Berlin and deliver impeccable transient response and ultra high frequency extension with no distortion. They're so proud of their AMTs, in fact, that they threw them in their signature line of head phones, which they didn't send to me, but I'm really curious to try for what it's worth. Next, they've got something they call the linearizer. Now, if it's your first time hearing that word, don't worry, it was my first time too. The linearizer is essentially built-in timer DSP that's designed to correct an inevitable phase delay that occurs when the loudspeaker, any loudspeaker for that matter, is reproducing sound in its enclosure. The issue that the linearizer is trying to solve is that when producing sound with a loudspeaker, high frequencies travel quicker than mid and lows, causing a kind of phase delay. So you've got a problematic delay for the lows and the mids, not a big issue for the highs since they're already traveling pretty quickly. What are the sonic consequences of this undesirable phase shift? Well, a less punchy sound, less transient emphasis, a less clear sonic image. Honestly, it kind of depends on how good your ears are and what kind of music you're working on. So what the linearizer is designed to do through digital signal processing is kind of hold the fire of the audio for about 10 milliseconds or so and correct this phase delay before those vibrations move out through the air and into your ears. Imagine that light prism that you see on a Pink Floyd shirt where the white light beam is refracted through a glass prism into a rainbow of colors. As I understand it, the linearizer is doing things the other way around. It's intaking these delayed frequency threads, passing them through its filters and delivering something tightly coiled and defined for the listener. The linearizer was a signature feature of the first generation of this loudspeaker, the Type 20 Mark 1s, but I believe it was controlled through a DAW plugin or standalone app on your computer. So now the DSP is integrated within the monitors and all you have to do is switch the potentiometer on or off on the back of the loudspeakers to disengage or engage this correction. And finally, 
on the Why We're Different Whistle Stop Tour, the closed or ported feature. Now, Head give you the choice to plug up the base ports or leave them open. Most speaker sets you'll come into contact with are open by default and don't offer you an instrument designed to seal that enclosure. But before we go too deep into this subject, why would you want to plug those holes in the first place? Well, just like some folks used to throw paper tissue over the tweeters of the early NS10s to tamp down on high frequency harshness, low end can be overpowering in its own way. So overpowering that you're feeling the bass more than hearing what you need to. I love voluminous low end, but it's also important to hear what's really there and allow the loudspeakers to describe bass properly, especially for critical listening. Now, closing those ports doesn't mean that the bass won't come out. It just means that the bass will be more controlled and to borrow a Klaus Heinz term that he used in Head's marketing, it'll be more polite. All you need to do is shove those plugs in there, making sure that the little opening for the key that they give you is obviously facing out. Then, make sure the plug is flush with the exterior of the ports and you've got a closed system. Once heads are plugged, you can flip the COP, which is closed or ported switch, to closed on the back of each loudspeaker. This, they say, results in a cleaner sound and increased resolution in the low end. But beware, there is a 6 to 10 dB reduction in maximum SPL, depending, of course, on the audio material that you're working on. And this is just in the low frequencies and a consequence of this setup. Now, I've tested both closed and open settings, and you'll notice that right now I haven't closed. More on that later. Also, just for housekeeping, you've got three distinct desktop filters, two shelving filters, and a neat little bass extension mode that lets you access even lower frequency areas at some cost of SPL. And all of the stuff I just described can be controlled via the back of the monitors uh, using stepped aluminum potentiometers. They also go, the monitors, into a standby mode when you leave them alone for a time, and they power back up when you play some audio through them, which is actually very convenient. So, with all of that description out of the way, what's been my experience actually using them to make, mix, repair, and master music? First, let's cover just how useful those special features are that I've been describing. On the tweeters, I was a little worried. I'd gotten used to the beryllium sound of my focals, and if you watched my videos on the Atom A7Xs, you'll know their ribbon tweeters weren't the tweeters for me. And yeah, Head is a completely different company, but I was bringing some baggage from that experience as I was listening critically to the heads. In my testing of the tweeters, a really freaky thing happened. In some modern songs I've been listening to for a long time, I could suddenly hear this weird distortion, a fizzy crackle, if you will, in certain sections of songs. Something I hadn't heard before and I was listening back through other playback devices. It would go away and then come back and then go away in certain song sections. And my first thought was, this is distortion from the tweeters. This is bad. Maybe these are lemons or maybe the tweeter doesn't get along with certain instruments in a mix. Now, finally, I pinned down a track that I had the sound, uh, that crackle sound that I kept hearing. And if you want to check this yourself, head to 109 in the song Fleur de Lis by Phoenix on their record Tiamo. I've been revisiting that record a lot recently, actually. You'll hear this crackle right before they slam into the chorus. So to make sure I wasn't going insane, I got my hands on a flak version of the song. I was just streaming it brought it into RX to see if I could see the distortion, and then I used my headphones to see if I could hear the distortion, get away from the head monitors. And if I didn't hear it on the headphones and didn't see it in RX, I'd know something is up with the Type 20s. Now I can't play the song on this channel, but once again, the moment is 109 on that track. Anyway, I fired up RX9 and sure enough, I could see the crackle in the spectrogram, and I could hear it on my Sennheiser headphones. And what's more, Using a pass of decrackle, I could actually remove the issue, which is fun. Now here's why this is important. That record came out in 2017. I've listened to it a lot. I've never heard that crackle before. And by now I've confirmed that the distortion has been baked into the recording. It's not distortion from the head speakers, meaning the Type 20 Mark IIs revealed something new. Something if I were mixing or mastering, I might want to alert the band about and say, hey, do you want this fixed? 
I didn't hear that issue on my Focals, which granted are not a three-way system, but that crackle, that fizziness, that 14, 15, 16K stuff, that's tweeter territory. That's not something the new mid-range power in the heads would bring out necessarily. So I was pretty blown away by what the Type 20s revealed. Now for the linearizer. I'll be honest, the differences here were very subtle. You have to have another warm body in the room to switch the linearizer on and off, which is exactly what fiancés are for. So thank you, Maddie. I did notice a small difference in transient clarity with it on, and the punch on some tracks really came through a bit more, not hugely, but a little bit. And once you tune your ears to it, you can really hear a difference and take Head's word that those differences are benefiting your critical listening work, but they are subtle. Now for the COP or closed or ported system, as you can see, I'm definitely team closed after having tried both. Yes, there is SPL loss in the low end on top of some headroom protection happening from sound ID. So I do have to bring my monitor uh, potentiometer up quite a bit to get a decent level. And maybe this is the Kool-Aid talking, but to me, the kicks are way cleaner and clearer and the bass lines too. And any concerns I had about translation, by the way, disappeared when I did a quick check on a mix I was working on and some cues I was working on. I listened to them back on headphones and AirPods. The bass was just as present on any other playback devices. Um, but here in my room, when I played them through the heads, the bass was very clean, polite and clear. And the speakers had a very easy time describing low end in this room. It's interesting just how persuasive voluminous bass can be. You can think something sounds better just because it's pounding in your chest. I mean, in fact, I remember shopping for my first pair of loudspeakers, the Focals, and the sales rep encouraged me to do, um, well, to play Doing It Right by Daft Punk. And when I listened back on Doing It Right, which has huge low end, I was stunned by the low end reproduction. It definitely made me go like, wow, the low end is so boomy, so powerful. I have to buy these. But looking back, I feel like that boominess is maybe more of a sales technique than something you actually want from your loudspeakers if critical listening is gonna be your main activity on those loudspeakers. So at the end of the day, having the option to open uh, the ports if I want to or close them is really great. Um, especially if I want to see how bass is, is, is hitting if I'm working on low-end heavy genres like hip-hop and stuff. It's kind of like having two monitor sets in one. Anyway, moving on. The mid-range is really something on these monitors. The drivers powering them are awesome. In fact, the whole stereo image is clean and clear and vivid. Great stuff sounds great. Not so great stuff sounds not so great. And that's the point, right? The heads do a great job of representing what's truly there. So if you've made it this far, you might have noticed I really like the Type 20. So is there anything I don't like about them? Well, it's pretty nitpicky, but I really wish the linearizer switch was on the front of the unit so I didn't have to get up or call in a friend and stay put in the sweet spot. Another very minor issue is that it takes a little longer than I'd like for the monitors to switch from idle to on but at least they don't make this weird, annoying little noise that the Focals I tested did. I think they were the shapes. It was a long time ago. Another small downside is the lack of direct integration with Sonarworks or room correction software. Creating a profile with Sound ID in my room took not that much time, but we're seeing more and more pro audio loudspeaker brands like Genelec and Neumann build in tuning right into the monitors with proprietary tech like Genelec's AutoCal calibration algorithm, or in the case of Neumann, I think it's um, IK Multimedia that they work with. In fact, the new Jones Scanlon, I think, Reds have Sonarworks built in. I'd like to see Head integrate something natively in their systems like this. And also, it would make sure that the tuning tech is gelling nicely with their phase shift correction tech in the linearizer. Now, for what it's worth, with sound ID enabled, I had no trouble perceiving the effect of the linearizer switched on and off. Though I did wonder if adding two stages of DSP correction, one with the sound ID tech and another with the head DSP would cause any trouble, but honestly, I couldn't perceive any issues. Let's talk about aesthetics, which do matter a lot. Like I said at the beginning, the heads are visually very similar to the atoms and perhaps less so when you stick the plugs in, but still. Both have gold tweeters, black finish. Yeah, they look similar. There's clearly advantages though to being visually evocative of the Atom brand, right? 
After all, Adam Audio is a very well-respected and well-known company globally. The founder of the company came from the Adam world. Why try to hide that in the design? For all we know, the people seeing head, knowing the Adam heritage might think, hey, this is like Phil Collins leaving Genesis, going off to start a way more commercially successful thing. Uh, I have to try these. Or maybe these are the perfected Adams. Now, on the other hand, some folks might see the similarities and think, are these less capable Adams? Or maybe they had a bad experience with Adams and they look very similar. So they're thinking, I'm probably going to have a bad experience with these. I'm only saying this because we all judge books by their covers, and I bet that Head are at least a little tired of the they look like Adams comments. Whatever the case, I'm assuming that a major design departure would have significant implications for the company at a brand level and maybe even at a sourcing parts level, and definitely recalibrating all the phase correction DSP if the enclosures are different. Now, the brand similarities I think have another downside. I suspect that Head wants to appeal to the pro audio community, the mixing engineers, mastering engineers. Adam have a lot of appeal and sway with beat makers and producers and creators. This visual association might be hurting their ambitions to reach the audience that they want. Anyway, in conclusion, I'm a huge fan of these monitors and my time with them has been extremely positive. After having spoken to the team at Head, I get the sense that they want to be associated with pro brands like Genelec, Neumann, PMC. And after testing the Type 20 Mark IIs, to me, there's no question that Head belongs in that club. The features like the linearizer and the COP system are very clever competitive advantages because they make you wonder why other loudspeaker systems don't offer those customizations. So if you really like those features, as I do, you might think twice before considering other brands that don't offer you that level of control. Head remind me a little bit of Lewitt in that they're a smaller company competing for um, market share amid a sea of other players that, let's face it, all sound really good. But if you're serious about monitoring, you owe it to yourself, I think, to audition a set of heads. They might surprise you because they are really incredible loudspeakers. Now, if you have any questions or comments, let me know in the comments section. And to learn more about Head, check out the description for more info. If there's other monitors you want me to take a look at, I've done uh, reviews on Focal, I've done reviews on PMCs. Also, let me know in the comments and uh, we'll see you in the next one soon. It's good to be back. See ya. Thank you.